Okay, uh, so welcome to last day here. Um, although I did uh, post up a recorded lecture on this last little bit here, 17 on equilibrium, since we have the time today and no way we could review everything, obviously, today. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just go over the last little part here of equilibrium. So together in person, I just make sure everybody's on the same page on that. And then we'll talk about uh, what's left with this just the final, I think, at this point. Oh. All right, so uh, last time here uh, together, we were talking about equilibrium. And again, remember that equilibrium uh, does involve a specific type of reaction and they are reversible reactions. And we can typically see reversible reactions written with arrows of head in both directions. And as we talked about, uh, basically it has a forward direction, which is when our reactants go to products. Uh, it also, at some point, once that forward reaction sort of starts, uh, you'll have enough products that will be made uh, that they will decide to sort of come together and head back in the other direction, uh, which is sometimes referred to as our reverse direction. Eventually, uh, what will happen is the system will reach chemical equilibrium. And when it reaches uh, chemical equilibrium, Once again, it does not mean that uh, you have the same amount on both sides of the arrow. Uh, what we're really talking about here is the rate of that forward reaction uh, will equal the rate of the reverse reaction. So essentially when it does reach equilibrium, our reactants are making our products at really the same rate as our products are then recombining and going backwards and making our reactants. What that essentially will do is, as we talked about, lock everybody into place in terms of where their concentration is at that particular point. Uh, they pretty much will be able to maintain that concentration uh, because, again, just as quick as a little bit goes away, it comes right back at the, really the same rate. Um, it also would mean if you're dealing with some type of equilibrium that involves gases and pressures as well, uh, that they would be able to barely maintain their pressure at where they're at at that particular point. Uh, there is a relationship when you have this type of reaction, it reaches equilibrium, uh, which is known again as the equilibrium constant, which is capital K. And once again, to calculate the equilibrium constant, we essentially will take our products uh, divided by our reactants. And the brackets uh, means concentration. And usually what they uh, refer to usually is molarity in terms of the type of concentration unit. When we do calculate the K using the concentrations, we do take our products, uh, which would be in this example here, C to the C. And an important part of it is we also do need to take the coefficients as the exponents here, uh, D to the D divided by A to the A and B to the B here. And when you do it for something with concentrations, it is sometimes referred to as being uh, the KC value, uh, C meaning concentration, that you basically did it for concentration. As I mentioned, if you had, say, gas that's going on here, uh, you could also write another K value, which is sometimes referred to as KP for pressures. Uh, where you basically do the same thing, the partial pressure of C to the C, partial pressure of D to the D, divided by the partial pressure of B to the B, and the partial pressure of A to the A in that particular case. Now, the KC and the KP, yeah. Uh, no, so when you write these, there are a couple of things that you don't include in there, and the uh, two things that you do not include uh, are anything that is... Uh, a solid or a liquid. So anything that's a solid and a liquid does not get included. What does get included in that case is actually aqueous and things that are gases. So you do include anything that are those guys in that particular case. So um, in your question, if you have a gas that should be included, uh, but if you did have a pure liquid, it wouldn't. 
And the really reason why solids and liquids are not included is because essentially you can think of a solid as kind of just sitting there, right? If it drops into like a beaker, it's not going to do much in the solid state. It's really not interacting or anything like that. And usually pure liquids, something like water, their concentrations remain relatively constant over the whole period of time. So there's not much change that occurs with that. So that's why typically we leave those out. Things that are aqueous means that typically what that is, is usually ions that are floating around in the solution a lot of times. And that means that they're floating around ready to react and obviously can't participate. And also uh, things that are in gas phase, if you're dealing with a gas equilibrium, uh, they're flying around, which means they're constant in motion and stuff like that. And they can interact, which is why they definitely would participate in it. Other questions on that? Okay. Now, when we talk about KC and KP, for example, uh, they typically uh, are not the same values, uh, but they do tell you something. And that's something else we talked about, which is uh, if you have a large value of K, what that means is when you reach equilibrium, you would mainly expect to have products present at that point. And to get a large value, just think about it mathematically here, uh, we would need a larger number of products divided by a smaller number of reactants to get a big number. Uh, and vice versa, if you have sort of a small value of K, uh, that means that when you do reach equilibrium, you would mainly have reactants present. And it's the same idea, mathematically speaking, in order to get a small number, we would need much larger number there on the bottom, which means we have more reactants than products to do that. What's considered a large value or a small value, a large value is considered really anything above one. So one is sort of considered, one and above is considered large. Uh, less than that is considered a small value. K is also a nice thing in terms of, uh, although we yell about units all the time in chemistry, it's one of the few things in chemistry that really does not have units associated with it. Uh, it is usually just a number and really no units are usually uh, kind of put on K values. Uh, and that's because they really don't cancel out correctly. So we just look at it as the number and really the proportion. The idea of the K is an equilibrium constant, which means it is going to be the same value regardless of what you do in that particular reaction. You will always come to rest at the same proportion of products to reactants, whether you started with all reactants, uh, whether you started with all products, whether you started with a little bit of reactants and products, it will always come to the same value of K regardless of what you start with. And sometimes people think, well, I, I use more reactants say in this experiment than the first one like I should get a different value of K and that's not the case. So you will always get the same proportion of reactants to products. The only time you will get a different value for K is actually if you change the temperature. So if you compare the K value, at say 25 degrees to the K value at 35 degrees, those values will be different. But if you did a bunch of experiments at 25 degrees Celsius, the K value will be the same all the time. And if you did a bunch of experiments at 35 degrees Celsius, they will all be the same number. Just the comparison between 25 and 35, you would have a different value. So again, sometimes people wonder, you know, how you could do that. Maybe just think about a simple math problem, right? You know, if I take four over two, that equals two. If I take eight over four, that equals two. If I take two over one, that equals two. So although we have different numbers of say products over reactants in each of these cases, the ratio basically all ends up to be the same. And that's sort of the idea there that you can start with multiple amounts of reactants and products. As long as you keep the temperature constant for every experiment that you do, you should end up with the same equilibrium constant value when it's all said and done. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it, will, it won't matter. So for example, say if we did, uh, we did this reaction here, and we did one experiment where we started with say four molar this guy and two molar this guy and nothing of this guy basically. And then we did another experiment where we did, you know, two molar this guy, one molar this guy and three molar that guy. When you would calculate and do this experiment, as long as the temperature stays the same for both of those experiments, the ratio of products to reactants will always end up being the same. So it doesn't really matter in terms of concentrations or even the pressures really, if you change the pressures type of situation, uh, as long as that temperature is really the only factor that has uh, an effect on the actual value of the rate constant or the equilibrium constant here. Other questions? 
And that's the same idea, although we may have different numbers when we kind of put it into our products over reactions like we do here, uh, you'll end up with the same sort of result uh, when you divide them and stuff like that. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So I think we did this one last time. So again, when we do go to write an equilibrium constant, this would be our KC value. We would take our products here, uh, again, using our coefficient as the exponent, divided by our reactants. Here, the coefficient is one. So much like most things in chemistry, if there's nothing written there, it's assumed to be one and not zero, uh, and times the H2 here that is cubed. So if we did have values, uh, we would need equilibrium concentrations to go into this expression to actually calculate the value of K. Uh, if you were doing with pressures, you would need equilibrium pressures to go in there to calculate it. Uh, by the way, pressures, usually if you're doing anything that involves sort of equilibrium constant or equilibrium sort of calculations, uh, usually atmospheres is the unit that you should have it in as you're kind of doing the calculation. Um, even if they kind of give it to you in different units and want the answer in different units, atmosphere is sort of the standard unit when you're kind of doing these type of calculations, but they would need to be equilibrium concentrations or pressures to go into this type of thing. So as I mentioned before, the value of K is the same regardless at a given temperature. And as we were talking about there, again, if we did a number of experiments at a temperature of 25 degrees and we did experiments one, two, and three, all three of them, regardless of what we start with, how much of each one we start with, they all should end up with the same K value. And if we did another set of experiments at 45 degrees Celsius, and we did experiments, say, four, five, and six, all four, five, and six should end up with the same value of K. But if we compare the K values between the two different temperatures, uh, we will end up with different values of K. So um, that is the most important thing. You keep that temperature constant, you always end up with the same rate uh, experiment equilibrium constant. But again, if you change it between two different temperatures, uh, you'll end up with different values depending on the temperature. So let's take a look here. If we wanted to write the equilibrium expression, as we talked about the things that we do not include or anything that's a pure liquid or solid, in this case, that is not a problem as everything is aqueous, which means everything should be included here. So we would have our equilibrium constant starting with our products, which would be H plus times the concentration of acetate divided by the concentration of acetic acid in this case. And that looks like obviously the one that they circled here. <clears throat> in this case, all the coefficients are one, so we don't have to worry about uh, taking anything to like the second or third power. All right, so let's take a look at this. For the reaction, calculate the equilibrium constant at a the given equilibrium concentration. So if we were to do this, we would want to start with our equilibrium constant for this. So again, it would be our products, which would be our NO2. Here, we would need to square it because of the coefficient that is there. We would divide it by the concentration of our N2O4. Here again, the coefficient is one. At this point, since these are the equilibrium concentrations, we could plug it in and we would go 0 0.060 squared divided by our 0 0.055. And I'm going you know, to trust them that they calculated it right. We'll go with the one that's boxed at that point. And we do end up with a K value of 0 0.065. That is considered a small value of K, which means when we do reach equilibrium, we would mainly expect to have reactants present uh, in a greater proportion than obviously products in this case. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> All right, so we kind of talked about this a second ago, but there are homogeneous equilibrium. Homogeneous equilibrium is much like a homogeneous mixture, uh, which means it's the same throughout. Uh, it's the same idea here with our homogeneous equilibrium. It means that everybody here is in the same phase. So everybody's in the same phase along the way here. And if we were to write our equilibrium expressions for each of this, these guys here, we could write a KC, which would be the concentration of NH3 squared 
divided by the concentration of N2 and our H2, which we would need to cube it again because of the coefficient. This actually are all gases, which means you could do it in terms of pressure rather than molarity. And that again would be what is sometimes referred to as a KP expression. Works the same way as the partial pressure squared of NH3 divided by the partial pressure of N2 times the partial pressure of H2 cubed. Um, on the bottom one here, we would do our KC, concentration of H plus CN minus divided by HCN. On the bottom one here, there is no gases. So obviously you can't have any pressure if you got no gas. Uh, so there is no KP sort of expression that you could write for that particular one. Again, because there's really no gases involved. Any question on either of those there? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so if, if you did have something, for example, that was, say, a solid or a liquid or something like that, so let's just say you had something like uh, this here where you had maybe a gas plus this, which is a gas, goes to this, which is, say, a solid or something like that. In this case, you would do your products over your reactants, but because our products is a solid, uh, here's where I think somebody asked earlier, this is where you would do the one over the reactants in this case, because uh, there's really nothing on the product side that you would put there, uh, but you would still do the other guy just like normal here since those are verb gases. And if you were going to do it for pressure, you do the same thing, just one over that. And obvious as well that if you had, say, something like this, In this particular case here, we have aqueous on our product side, solid here on our reactant side. So in the case of this, this would just be our products would be the only thing that would be included in our equilibrium expression. So technically speaking, it would be over one, but obviously you don't need to put the one there for that particular case. So if you got any all solids or uh, liquids there on your reactant side, it's basically just going to be the products as your equilibrium expression. And if you have... Uh, all your products that are either uh, solids or liquids, then it's going to be one over your reactants, basically, as to how you handle that. Yeah. You, you could. So it would it would work the same way. So it would just be uh, the K is equal to one over the partial pressure of A, partial pressure squared of B in this case as uh, those things would be included and there's really nothing else going on. So you would have some pressures for that. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. All right, so here's our heterogeneous equilibrium where we do get sort of that mixture of, of those things that can occur. So if here on our first one, uh, we got our solids here on both sides. So in this case, our K would be the concentration of O2 cubed. Uh, and again, in this case, you could also do it for pressure, which would be the partial pressure of O2 cubed as well. Uh, here we have just our gases there and our liquid, which would not be included. Uh, so this would be our K, our H2 squared, and our O2, once again, just our products in this case, as basically it's over one, which is basically what our reactants uh, account to. Once again, the reason that solid and the liquid really doesn't participate is, again, as I mentioned, the solid just kind of sits there. So in order for it to really participate, you know, if you think about if you did have it, say, in a beaker, a solid sitting there, the only way really for that to participate is it would have to start to dissolve. And at that point, it would then be ions, which would be included. But it in a solid form is basically just sitting there, uh, kind of doing not much in a sense. So the position of a heterogeneous equilibrium does not depend on the solids or the liquids. Uh, so again, we will leave those guys out as we write our equilibrium expressions. So here's one, uh, which is really a KSP type situation. We have our aqueous ions there on our products, solid over here on our reactants. And that gives us really uh, a K that is calcium and fluoride squared. This is sometimes referred to as a KSP sort of equilibrium. SP stands for solubility product. There's a whole set of equilibrium uh, sort of reactions and constants 
that are for things that if you think about your solubility rules, if you remember those, uh, there are certain things that are insoluble based on solubility rules. So even though something is, for example, insoluble based on solubility rules, everything, even insoluble things have a degree of solubility. So a very small fraction of it will actually break apart into its ions, a really super small amount usually in most cases. And there's a whole set of uh, equilibriums that involve that. When you take 1B, you got a whole chapter on that uh, about those type of equilibriums. Um, they are, as you might expect, usually very small values. And that means that typically speaking, uh, you pretty much have reactants most of the time, which is usually the solid version of it. And that's why we consider it to be basically insoluble. One of the other things you learn when you get there as well is uh, just because solubility rules say something should be a solid, uh, there's a lot of factors that uh, come into play as to whether or not you would actually see the solid form, things like the concentration of the ions, uh, pH, is there other common ions floating around? So there's a lot of things as you might learn as you go through to 1B uh, that like, oh, I learned this like solubility rules say it's always going to show you a solid or you're always going to get a solid. And there's a lot of factors like the conditions are really important as to whether or not you would see that. But uh, these things are usually super small, like uh, the one I wrote on the previous one with the silver chloride. That's also a KSP and uh, one of those uh, solubility rules that chlorides are insoluble when it's hooked up with silver. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Le Chatelier's principle. And Le Chatelier's principle is the idea of you basically have a system that is at equilibrium which means it is kind of rolling back and forth in terms of its uh, forward and reverse reaction at the same rate. And then you basically do something to it to screw up the equilibrium. So you essentially will add a stress to that equilibrium. So you have this system that's going back and forth at the same rate, and you add some type of stress. Stresses that you could add are concentration, you could do something with the pressure or volume. You could do something with temperature. You could also add a catalyst. And these are all things that will, or most of them will, do something to that equilibrium that's going to essentially mess it up, which means the rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are no longer equal to each other. But ultimately, a, a system that's at equilibrium or a system that can get to equilibrium will always want to get back to that equilibrium state. So no matter what you do to it, it's always going to want to kind of move itself back to that rate of the forward reaction and reverse reaction equaling each other. So typically what will happen is the system will do one of three things, either uh, shift to the right, which basically means you need more products. It will shift to the left, uh, which basically means you need more reactants. Are there are certain things, no matter kind of what you do to it, uh, that essentially will uh, cause no change to occur. So even though you kind of did something to it, it's going to really cause no change to occur. So let's take a look at each of these here and, and see uh, what happens as we go through it. We'll start with concentration which is similar to what you did in that experiment a bit ago. Uh, concentration, you basically have two things. You could either add more, and typically when we add more, it will shift away from the side we added it to. A good way to remember that is AA, add away. And the other thing you could do is remove. Uh, something and when you remove it will shift to the side you removed from so what happens in this situation is a couple of things so when we remove something uh, there's really two ways that you essentially could remove something from a solution you can't just reach in and like grab out an ion or anything like that they they frown upon that, I think. Uh, so really the two ways that you can really remove something from a solution is you could add something to it, 
uh, that will cause a precipitate to form. So that's a solid, which as we talked about, is not part of the equilibrium. And that's essentially like reaching in and pulling one of the ions out of solution. And that's going to cause a shift in equilibrium to occur. The other thing that you could do is also like one of the ones you did in that experiment. Uh, if you have hydroxide OH minus or H plus in the reaction, you could add an acid or base to it and it will form water, which is also a pure liquid and not included in the equilibrium. So you could add something that forms water, which is essentially removing H plus or OH minus from that solution. Now, adding more is really simple. You just grab a reagent off the shelf that has that ion in it, and you just squirt it into your thing, and you add it, or like in your case, scoop something in there that has it in there that will dissolve. So when we have a system that's at equilibrium uh, like this here, And if this guy over here is my reactant, this guy is my product. If I have somebody hop on over here on the product side, what that's going to do is he's already at equilibrium. That's going to mess up the equilibrium. So I now got a couple guys over here. Not so good over here. Stick figure form here. So in this case, we added more products. So to fix the situation, to kind of return back to equilibrium, we would actually have to shift away from the side. We added it to, we'd have to put more people there on the left-hand side to bring it kind of back down. And it would shift away towards the reactant side. And that would bring us back to equilibrium at that point. And we're now back to really the equilibrium sort of position. So in this case, we added more products, gonna shift towards the reactant side. And in the case if we had more reactants, it would shift to the product side. The reason it's really doing that is when we add more products, uh, it is meaning that we have a lot more products available to us. And what that's going to mean is they're going to be able to react a lot quicker than our reactants. And that's going to cause the reverse reaction in this case to really kick off. And that's why it will shift away from it. Same thing if you add more reactants, you now have a lot more reactants available than products which means the availability of all those reactants it means they're going to start reacting a lot quicker and that's going to cause the forward direction to occur. And that's why it always shifts away from the side you add it to because you're causing that direction of reaction to occur. Now, if we did something like removing here and we start over here in our equilibrium position with our reactant and our product, this guy hops off. Uh, that's going to cause this to occur here. And now in this particular case, uh, to fix it, we actually have to go towards the side we removed it from. Uh, you could think of it like there's a hole now on this side. You got to fill it. So you can go towards it to kind of fill that side. And that will cause us to get back to equilibrium now after we do that at that particular case. So when you do remove something, either a reactant or a product, you're really causing sort of, like I said, like a hole on that side and you've got to kind of go towards it to fill it. The real reason of what's happening is when you remove a product like we did in this example, you now have way more reactants than products, which means they're going to start reacting pretty quickly and you're going to start making more products and it's going to cause that kind of reverse forward direction in that case to occur. Same thing would happen if you removed reactants you would cause a lot more products to be available and that's going to cause the reverse reaction to start to happen and it would go towards the side you removed it from. So uh, when you remove, it goes towards it and when you add more, it goes away from it and it's really about happening the forward reaction or the reverse reaction is really what you're sort of kicking off. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now, a couple other things that can affect equilibrium is pressure and volume and these guys are usually tied together a lot of times with our friend Boyle and his relationship P1 V1 equals P2 V2 for example what we know about that is if my pressure goes up typically what that means is my volume should go down and in that situation what we will have is a situation where we have a much smaller volume which means the pressure will go up so we kind of want to bring the pressure back down but because we're in a much smaller volume, we need actually less gas molecules in that small volume. So it will shift to the side 
with the least number of gas molecules. And that is obviously dependent on, you know, the reaction you're looking at as to which side is more or less gas molecules. You essentially look at the coefficients and anybody with a G and add them up and see what you got going on on both sides of the arrow. Opposite is true. If my pressure drops, that means that my volume should increase. And in this case, we have a much larger sort of area where our gas molecules are going to be flying around. So pressure coming down, we kind of want to bring the pressure back up. That means we need more gas molecules in that larger area. So again, it would shift in this case to the side uh, with the most number of gas molecules. So when you think about pressure and volume, typically a lot of times the volume is the way to sort of think about it. Uh, small volume, less gas molecules, larger volume, more gas molecules to fill it. And that's a good way to sort of think about it. So if I had uh, something like uh, for this here, if we shifted, uh, we'll shift to the left, uh, we'll go to the right, or there be no change if I uh, added more D, I removed A, I increased the pressure, added C, and um, increased the volume. So take a moment for each of those. Which way would this equilibrium shift in this case? Okay, let's take a look here. So if we're going to add more D, uh, that is a product. What that essentially is going to do is cause the reverse reaction to kick off because we have a lot more products than reactants. Uh, so it should shift there to the left. In the case of removing A, when we remove A, once again, uh, that is going to cause like a hole over here. And that also would mean we actually would have more products than reactants in this case and cause the reverse reaction to also occur. Again, if you want to think about it, to fill that hole that's over there on the left-hand side, uh, and it also should go to the left. In this case, we're going to increase the pressure, which means if we increase the pressure, we have a much smaller volume. And that means that we do want the side that has the least number of gas molecules. In this case, uh, that is three gas molecules there, plus one is four. On this side, we have two and one, which is three. So in this case, we would actually shift it to the right as the right has less gas molecules than the left in this particular case. Any question on those there? Adding C, once again here, C is a product, which means we will now have more products and reactants. And that is going to cause our reverse reaction to occur. And lastly here, if we increase the volume, that means our pressure will actually go down, but really in a larger volume, we will need more gas molecules to bring the pressure back up. Uh, so in this case, it will also shift here to the left. Any questions on any of those shifting there? Okay, so uh, temperature is the last thing, as we talked about, does affect obviously the value of the rate constant, the rate constant, the equilibrium constant, uh, but temperature works the same. as concentration, uh, which means if we increase the temperature, it will shift away. And if we decrease the temperature, it will shift towards it. And really temperature is all dependent on what type of reaction you're dealing with. Is it an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction? So if it is a exothermic reaction, when we have an exothermic reaction, we think of heat and energy as being a product, like is being given off. And that means that if we increase the temperature of an exothermic reaction, it should shift to the left. And if we throw everybody on ice, it should bring the equilibrium to the right there as we remove the heat or energy. And if we have a endothermic reaction, 
we think of heat and energy as a reactant in that case, like it's being absorbed. Uh, so that is a reactant, which basically means the opposite there. If you increase an endothermic reaction, uh, put all your beakers on a hot plate or something like that, or hot water bath, it will shift it to the right there towards the products. If you remove uh, energy, put everybody on ice, again, it will go to the left in this case. The way most often exothermic and endothermic is related to most people when they're doing this type of thing is using the change in enthalpy, right? So that is the change in enthalpy that we talked about in the energy chapter. Uh, that's the heat of a reaction. And if it's an exothermic reaction, that is going to be a negative number. And if it's an endothermic reaction, it would be a positive number. So uh, remember that if you're trying to determine exothermic or endothermic and you have the delta H value given to you for that reaction, the number really doesn't matter. It's actually the sign of the number that's important. So if you see a negative, it's going to be exothermic. And if you see a positive, it'll be endothermic. Question on temperature there. <clears throat> Lastly, you could add a catalyst, uh, which is not a reactant. Uh, it's not a product. And it does not get used up. But is there usually just to uh, facilitate the reaction happening faster? As we talked about, it does so by lowering that activation energy, that hill that the reactants has to climb to get to the other side in terms of energy. Uh, by finding an alternative pathway for that to occur. Uh, it typically will have no change. Other ways that you could get no change is if maybe you add like a noble gas to it. Noble gases are chemically inert, which means they will not affect the equilibrium. Uh, the other way that you could also get a no change, which can occur is, uh, let's just say we had a gas equilibrium of 2A, uh, goes to 2B in this case. In this particular case, there is no side that is more or less gas molecules. It's basically a push there, right? Uh, so if you uh, lower the pressure, increase the pressure, change the volume, in that case, there is no side that will go more or less. So it will actually be no change that could occur. So that's the other situation that you could kind of get a no change in. Uh, you actually end up with kind of the equal numbers of gas molecules on each side. Any questions on Le Chatelier's principle there? So let's take a look at one here. Maybe delta H here is negative 135 kilojoules. All right. So will we shift to the left, to the right, or no change? If we increase the temperature, uh, we remove H2. We decrease the volume. We uh, add N2, we decrease the temperature, we add a catalyst, and we decrease the pressure. All right, take a moment, and for each of those, which way will we be shifting? <clears throat> so first off, we'll start with... Uh, the increase in the temperature, here we are given the delta H, and really all we have to look at is the negative, and that will tell us it's an exothermic uh, reaction, which means if we were to add heat or energy to this equation, we should think of it as a product, and that means that when we increase the temperature, that would be like adding more products, and that will cause the reverse reaction to occur, and it should actually shift there away from it on that side. If we remove H2, that is a reactant. So once again, if you want to think about it, you're kind of creating a hole over there that needs to be filled. So that also will cause the equilibrium to shift towards the side we removed it from. Once again, you're essentially will have more products and reactants in that case. If we decrease the volume here, that means that our pressure actually will go up in this case. And that means we really want to alleviate the increase in pressure. So in that small volume, we need less gas molecules. Here we have four gas molecules. Over here we have two, uh, which means in this case, it will actually shift to the right-hand side, which is the least number of gas molecules. 
If we add N2, that is more reactants, which will cause a greater chance of reactants coming together and the forward direction basically occurring. So it will shift to the right. If we lower the temperature, that would be like removing some product here, and that would cause a hole on our product side. And once again, that would want to fill that hole and go towards it. And that will cause the equilibrium to shift to the right. Once again, really what's happening is you have a lot more reactants than products. So that's going to cause the forward direction uh, to basically occur. If we add a catalyst, that's going to be a no change is going to occur. It'll just get there quicker, but it will not cause any shift in equilibrium. And lastly here, if we lower the pressure, that means that really our volume has increased. So in a much larger volume, we need less gas, mo uh, more gas molecules in this case. Uh, and that would actually be to our left here, which would be more gas molecules. Any questions on any of those shifts or Le Chatelier's principle there? Yeah. Yeah. Are you adding it to like um, the product side or the reactor? So when you, uh, when you decide about increasing temperature or lowering temperature, the first thing you want to determine is, is it exothermic or endothermic reaction? So in this particular made up example, not the right number, by the way, but uh, the made up example here, which is negative, uh, tells us that this reaction overall is exothermic. So we think of heat and energy, not correct in all aspects of it, but we think of heat and energy as really being like a product. So in that case, for this reaction, our heat and energy, our temperature value, if you want, is sitting as a product. And that means that if you lower the temperature, you're removing product. And if you increase the temperature, you're adding product. And it would be opposite if this was an endothermic reaction. If it was endothermic reaction, you would lock the heat or temperature sort of uh, aspect of it on the reactant side and treat it as a reactant. So the opposite would happen if it was endothermic. If you increased it, it would cause it to shift to the right away from the reactant side. And if you decrease it, it would come towards the reactant side. I guess, yeah. So, uh, the temperature doesn't change in a sense. Uh, you know, we think of it as either being locked in place as either a reactant or a product, depending on if it's exothermic or endothermic. And then you're either going to add more to it or remove it, uh, depending on which side is sort of locked into in that sense. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> and that's what we talked about. Talked about talk about that. All right, let's take a look at these and see what we got going on here. Consider the following equilibrium. How many of these would lead to a shift uh, towards the reactant? So we're looking for anything of these guys that will cause the reactants to be made and the equilibrium to shift there. So let's take a look at each of these and see. Uh, if I remove CO, CO is actually a product which actually would cause the equilibrium to shift to the right. So that clearly would not do it. In this case, we're going to add some O2, which means we have more products and that's going to cause it to shift away. So that will do it. So that's one. If we remove CO2, CO2 is a reactant, which would cause a hole over here. That means you have more products and reactants, which would cause the reverse reaction to occur. So that definitely would do it and probably no Surprise here, our last one will also do it. If we increase the pressure, uh, that means that the volume is going down. So we want less gas molecules. Uh, so on this side, we have two total. On this side, we have two plus one, which is three. So that is going to cause it to shift to the left. So uh, everybody but the first thing here will cause the equilibrium to shift to the left or the reactant side. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at this one. Uh, one method is through this endothermic. How many of these would decrease the amount of H2? So we're looking to decrease the amount of H2, which means the only way to do that is to cause the equilibrium to shift away from H2, basically. Uh, this is endothermic. So as sort of your question, because this is endothermic, if we needed to place heat or energy or temperature on one side of the equation as versus the other, it should be placed over here as a reactant. So now that we place it over there, because this is endothermic, now we can see if we do something with the temperature, how it will affect it. Uh, we will now consider it kind of like a concentration almost. Um, so here, if we added water uh, to this case, 
that will cause the equilibrium actually to shift away from it. So that's going to cause it to shift to the right, and it would not. By the way, water, should that be included in the equilibrium? It actually is in this case because it's not liquid, but it is a gas form of it, right? So the steam. So not all water is always excluded, but it is water in the liquid form that's excluded from the equilibrium. This would be included if you were to write the equilibrium expression for this guy. Uh, you would include everybody there, the CO, the H2 cubed divided by our CH4, and we would include this water because it's in the gas state. And because of that, it's flying around and participating in the equilibrium as opposed to its uh, liquid form. If we look at number two, the volume is double. That means we increase the volume. Uh, that means the pressure is going to go down. So we now need more gas molecules over here. We actually have two gas molecules. On our product side, we have four. And that means that we would shift it to the right in this case. And that would not decrease the amount of H2. If we removed CH4, which is a reactant, that would cause a hole on the reactant side. So it would cause more products to come together to fill that hole. And that actually would do the thing here. So that would be the one that would actually cause the H2 concentration to go down because we're shifting to the reactant side. And that would decrease the amount of our products. If the temperatures increased here, because our temperature is really a reactant, when we increase the temperature, we now have more reactants, which means the forward direction should occur. And that obviously would not decrease the amount of H2. It would cause a shift to the right there and actually increase the amount of H2 when you would do that particular case. Any questions on any of those there? <laughs> So we talked a little bit about this here. If the equilibrium lies to the right, uh, that means to the product side, we should have a large value of K. That means we have more products than reactants. And if it goes to the left there, we should have more reactants than products, which means we should have a small value of K in this particular case. All right, so lastly here, at a given temperature, K is equal to 50. Uh, calculate the equilibrium concentrations of H2 given that I2 is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2, and the equilibrium concentration of our product there is 5 times 10 to the minus 1. So since these are all equilibrium concentrations, we would start with our equilibrium constant, which would be the concentration of HI, and we would need to square it because of the coefficient that is present, divided by the concentration of H2 and I2, and that would be 50 in this case. Now, since we actually do have the equilibrium concentrations given to us, we could put them in, and that would give us 5 times 10 to the minus 1, and we would square it. We are looking for H2's concentration, and that would be our 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2. That equals 50. Basically, mathematically, we're going to multiply the H2 to both sides and then divide by 50. So they basically just switch places with each other. And that will give us an H2 concentration. I'm going to trust our math, hopefully, times 10 to the minus 1. We would need molarity here, as that is a concentration unit that we're sort of quoting. And that's what we should end up with at this point. Any questions on that there? Question on equilibrium or anything like that? All right. We'll wrap 